But first, it's Friday. I always love this day because we get to discuss all the great news that's been going on. And we welcome Jacksonville Today Enterprise reporter, Claire Heddles. Good Hi, morning, Jamie. Claire. We were, we were joking. I've never had to say Claire's last name, but uh, <laughs> this got is... got it right. <laughs> got it right. Okay, good, good. Good start to the morning. Also joining us, Mark Woods of the Florida Times Union. Good morning, Mark. Good morning. And joining us as well by phone, attorney Jack Webb. Good morning. How are you? Doing well. So grateful to have you with us. And also joining us is writer Shelton Hull. I call him Mr. Jacksonville himself because he always is everywhere and knows everything going on. Good morning, Shelton. Good morning. Happy Friday. Happy Friday to you as well. Okay, so lots to get to. I want to remind everybody of the phone number. 549-2937. You can also send us an email at firstcoastconnect at wjct.org. Make sure you leave us a comment on our Facebook page. You can also tweet at WJCT News. All right. So our top story, the Jags Stadium survey. Now, the results from that survey asked fans about the stadium of the future. Now, that survey was released on Tuesday and um, obviously it has a lot of information about what the fans want. 81% surveyed said that they wanted shade coverage as the number one item on the renovation wish list. And that was right behind improved airflow. And I feel like this is a little obvious coverage from the rain. That makes sense to me. Um, so obviously games in Florida have notoriously been difficult to sit through and temperatures consistently in the mid to high 80s for September home games. There's little to no relief from the sun and obviously the shade makes a lot of sense. So let's get right to it. Uh, you know, I want to start with uh, Claire. You know, what are your thoughts about this? You know, what I thought was interesting and I'll, I'll say this. Um, obviously important information, um, but uh, it'll be interesting to see what comes up, you know, what comes out of this survey and and who's going to be paying for it as well. <laughs> right. I mean, of course, the heat is rough, especially if the team is losing. And I think 51 percent of respondents were saying that the reason that they are respondents who didn't renew season passes said it was over the shade issue. But, of course, you know, we take this with a grain of salt that the Jaguars issued this survey and they're actively, you know, campaigning to figure out a financing plan from the city if the city wants to keep the the team here past 2029 when the contract expires. So, of course, people want shade, people want these things, but the real question is who's going to pay for it? And and that really hasn't been answered yet. And And when you look at the construction of stadiums and the cost, uh, Mark, it is it's not cheap nowadays. I mean, a stadium could easily cost a billion dollars. So it'll be interesting to see how all of this plays out. Right. Uh, Buffalo recently announced it's uh, building, I think it's a 1.4 billion new stadium with more than half of it from taxpayers. Um, I would envision, and this would fit in, that we'll end up going the path of Miami. Mm-hmm. I mean, I used to, before I came here, I covered the Dolphins and that was, they did a massive renovation to their stadium. And one of the major things they did was create shade. Um, you know, a lot of more cosmetic things. Um, but, you know, that makes sense. And in, in, in Florida, it's kind of crazy that we don't have that. Um, you know, I grew up near Green Bay, and I always said, you know, people talk about how tough Packers fans out there in the, you know, frozen tundra. I'd rather sit through one of those cold games oh, yeah. than, than be what, what Jaguar <laughs> fans go through in September is, is brutal. Yeah. I mean, um, so, yeah, I think it's understandable. Yeah, I think they, they probably want two things, shade and victories. So Yeah, we, we just got a comment from Tom who says, the number one thing Jaguars fans want in their stadium is a winning team. Right. Ouch. I just want to say Tom said that, not Jamie, so you don't have to tweet any negative things to me. Um, Mark, let me ask you about this, having that experience how did the situation play out with the Marlins? Because I know that they were in a situation where they wanted a lot of money to do what they needed to do to keep the team there. Um, you know, a lot of people have an issue with taxpayer money going to to pay, and, and a large sum of that to pay for a lot of these sports teams. Right, that, and that there's been a less willingness. It used to be the state of Florida would do more of that. There's been less of that now. Uh, more pushback. And I think there will be, 
you know, with the Jaguars, I think there's some people who, you know, will say, do whatever it takes to keep them. We have to, you know, lot J, a lot of us felt like was a bad deal and said, you know, they won't leave if that falls through. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there's others who say, you know, don't give them a dime. Um, I think there's probably a middle ground in figuring out what this city and taxpayers are comfortable with. Um, that's why I think it's, you know, there's no way, I don't think on earth it's a it's a brand new $1.5 billion stadium like Buffalo. Um, but there probably will be a pretty massive renovation that will be, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. And we want to remind everyone, we want you to be a part of the conversation. You can give us a call at 549-2937. Let's go to Ryan in Jacksonville. Good morning, Ryan. Good morning. And, and what do you have to say on this topic? Well, I'm a, a citizen of Jacksonville, but not necessarily a Jaguars fan. And I think that improving the stadium, especially for shade and airflow, makes a lot of sense. You know, we have heat stroke and things like that that impact our emergency rooms. We as taxpayers end up putting money into anyways. And so it makes sense for us to, to improve it. But as a person who's not a Jags fan and a person who has struggles with the taxes being used for the stadium – unless the Jaguars are going to actually kick back to the city. I mean, it's hard to say, let's keep supporting them. We put money into the team all the time and they tell us that it helps our economy, but they don't put any money back into the city. All right. Thank you. Ryan from Jacksonville. Shelton, your thoughts. Well, gosh, I mean, everything else about this franchise is shady. So the stadium might as well be shady too. Uh, You know, maybe spend a little more money to put more chlorine in the pools as well. Um, As far as the stadium goes, you know, it's a minor, minor renovations are needed to bring it up to the standards that fans want. Um, Every NFL team, every NFL city around the league has been raked over the coals and gaslit with the whole kick in X amount of money for stadium improvements or to build a new stadium or else we're going to leave. And a bunch of those teams end up leaving. Anyway, I think as it stands right now, our stadium is known to have one of the best, uh, in aesthetic aesthetic terms, uh, one of the best experiences of any stadium uh, in the country, if not the world. Um, as things stand right now, the main thing the Jaguars should be thinking of is winning. Right now, it's a time of uh, chaos and instability in the AFC South, even more so than usual. Uh, two of the four teams like had four wins or less last year, including our team. If the Jaguars really want to get stuff done, if they really want uh, the city and the taxpayers to get behind them on stadium improvements, lot J and whatever else right now, this season is a good time to make a playoff run. I mean, heaven forbid, if the Jaguars ever won the Super Bowl, we would let them do anything they wanted without question. We already let them do almost everything. So just win some games. It's easy. And again, we want to invite our listeners to join the conversation. 549-2937. That's 549-2937. Let's go to Mark on the West side. Good morning, Mark. Good morning. Uh, I think that I saw that survey, a friend of mine's a season ticket holder, and he showed me the survey because he knows I'm interested. But that survey seems like to me it should have also come with the caveat uh, from the desk of uh, Shad Khan. Um, I don't think we should. We Over the years, 20, 25 years, however long we've had this stadium, we pumped hundreds of may, probably half a billion dollars into this thing, you know, new TV screens, new seats, a swimming pool, all that stuff. And it, it, it's almost extortion to me that he's Shad Khan uh, is holding this. Yeah. You know, hey, if you don't do this, I'm out of here. Uh, Shad Khan is one of the few people in the entire world and certainly among NFL team owners that could write a check for all this. It's, you know, it's his team. They're the only ones that play there. They're probably the only ones that use that stadium on a regular basis. He could write a check for this. And we would, you know, if, if it's such a great idea, Shad, uh, if it was such a good idea. You pay for it. You know, you you keep saying you're bringing business and you're good for business. Well, of course you are. We're we're funding you know all your infrastructure. So, if and and if he leaves, he was never a part of the city anyway. So let him leave. I, again, you can't prove that they are bringing one dollar into the city, and now they want to take a billion dollars out of there. Leave, Shad. Just yeah, you know, this this is ridiculous. We've got trouble. We had to pass a special bond issue for schools and then for teacher raises. And we're going to a billion dollars of taxpayer money. He's just shameless, I think. All right, Mark, on the West side, thank you for sharing that. Jack, your thoughts. Hey, you know, after that call, I appreciate his position on it, but it's one of, 
I thank God every day I'm no, I'm no longer on the Jacksonville City Council to have to deal with these type of issues. Um, the reality is that uh, I, I think Shelton nailed it. You know, if the Jaguars start winning, um, then uh, the, I think the taxpayers will be more than uh, be more inclined to get off their wallet on this thing. Uh, as far as the financing goes, it's going to have to be a split deal somehow. Iguana mm-hmm. Development is the is the force behind this first downtown organization that did the survey. Iguana Investments is the master developer for the riverfront. So I don't think Khan is – I think this, this, this stadium re- renovation issue is just part and parcel of the entire project. So I don't think Mr. Khan – I don't think Khan – is holding a gun to anybody's head. I mean, I think it's just part of the, the reality that we face. If we want, you know, if we want to swim, if we want to play with the big dogs, then this is what's going to, this is what it's going to be. I mean, whether it's Buffalo, I just got back from Las Vegas on, on I had a client out there and, uh, and what they did, what the NFL did uh, for, for the Raiders out there is unbelievable. I'm not mm-hmm. saying that we have to match that here, but, uh, um, I, I, I applaud the Jaguars in a sense for getting out in front of this thing to address the issues now so that, again, we're not forced to sip water from a fire hose uh, when this lease is coming up uh, for renewal or expiration. Let's go to Denise in Nassau County. Good morning, Denise. Yeah, I was wanted to make a comment about the great stadium experience. Mm-hmm. It may be if you have club or box or fancy seats, it's a great stadium experience. But those of us who are occasional uh, attendees or have uh, the cheap seats, it is a horrible experience. It is freaking hot sitting in the sun. So some type of coverage is needed. And I think a split deal is a great idea. But it is not a great stadium experience for most of us, especially those who were there win or lose. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Denise, for being a part of the conversation. And and that's the thing. It seems like the diehard fans, it doesn't matter what's going on weather-wise or what the experiences they want to be there. But I think a lot of points that we're hearing make a lot of sense. I mean, I think when we talk about the quality of how the team has played for several seasons now, if they were able to turn that around, they I think it would be a much easier sell to to residents and to taxpayers. Charles says Jags losing is common to anyone who has been here and in capital letters a while. Martin says the stadium needs to be enclosed so that it can be air conditioned. That needs to be the owner's expense, not the city. If Shad threatens to move the team, then so be it. Shelton, your thoughts. Well, I think the the, the idea of the, of the Jaguars moving, I don't think it's, I think that's sort of much ado about nothing. I'd be surprised if the team ever left here. I would, frankly, I'd be surprised if any other city would uh, roll out the red carpet for Shah Khan the way we have, especially the way things have played out here. Um, I it's been stated before that if you go back over the last 50 years out of everyone that's owned any sports franchise for 10 years or more, Shah Khan has the lowest winning percentage of any sports franchise owner in any major sport in the world in the last 50 years. And, uh, and again, he could write a check for all this, um, putting, putting out shade for the cheap seat experience as a, as the lady mentioned, is a really good idea. I've been to games in all different parts of the stadium. Uh, you get there, uh, no, you get that direct sunlight overhead. You're gonna, you're definitely gonna be feeling it. You'll be sweaty, maybe a little bit dizzy. Um, the drinks, you know, the drinks are really good, so you're gonna be even more sweaty, even more woozy. And again, I think we're all on the same page as far as just the team needs to win football games. Uh, the fact that they've done so well and uh, monetized this franchise so well uh, with the record they have is remarkable. But if you, I'll say, I always say to people, if you've got a family and you want to really have a good sporting experience, a really positive, affordable experience, try try the Jacksonville Jumbo Shrimp. If you haven't been to a Jumbo Shrimp game, they're playing uh, this season. Go there, um, guaranteed good time. And we had a great time. There was a WJCT day there, and, and uh, despite the long lines, and they ran out of hot dogs. I was not a happy camper about that. It was still a lot of fun. Uh, Jack Webb, I, I want to ask you about that because a lot of people are are making the point, again, that, you know, there's this, there's this cost associated with it. When we see all the development right here near us at WJCT, 
across the street, all of the riverfront development that's going on. I mean, is it a real possibility that the Jags would leave if they did not get taxpayers to foot some of the bill? Well, to, to yeah, it's, that's a great question. The taxpayers are going to uh, put part of the bill. I mean, that's just the reality because rea- the reality is taxpayers own the stadium, okay? Uh, Con owns the team. The city owns the stadium and the other venues down in the entertainment district. So we do have some responsibility to maintain it, to upgrade it, and, you know, to make our tenant happy. But that said, uh, you know, again, what, what – what, uh, but uh, Mr. Lamping and Khan have been doing over the last few years, uh, reportedly, is diversifying the revenue stream to make to make the Jaguar entity organization profitable. They've been very successful in that. So they're going to they're going to they're, they're going to embed themselves in in the riverfront redevelopment. Okay, so I don't think they're going anywhere, and I, I think I don't think I think I think what they're doing is they're trying to avoid the inevitable or the possibility that the stadium in five years is a donut hole. In this, this, this grant, and their grandiose plans of redevelopment down there, and they're getting ahead of the game. But so, as far as the taxpayer funding, though, it's not going to be a direct check from the city, from the city of Jacksonville general revenue. Most likely, it's going to be some sort of formulaic approach. You know, taking bed tax money, uh, money that is is that can be bonded, that is dedicated for these types of purposes. Question for the finance committee and for the mayor's office is how much bed tax revenue do we have what's out there what are the revenue sources let's start figuring this thing out and so again so that we're not you know we're not uh, uh we're not reacting and making bad decisions at the 11th hour all right let's go to the phones linda in mandarin good morning linda and welcome to the conversation good morning um i understand what mr webb is saying um as a former city council person and mr khan like any businessman can diversify his revenue stream we all hear about diversified portfolios, but maybe if he spent less time coming up with a lot, J, coming up with a Four Seasons that the Four Seasons hasn't committed to yet on paper that I know of. We have money for the stadium. Um, you know, he's a businessman, so maybe if he took his money and did his business development for the Magical Hotel, for the whatever, then we could put those resources toward a stadium. But, you know, every year, let's say what it is, corporate welfare comes out when we have to every year. The city of Jacksonville, when they were going to do Lot J, we're going to have to go borrow $300 million to give to a billionaire. You don't have to be a math major, which I am, but that doesn't <laughs> add up. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have an advocate for us on city council or in the mayor's office. Mr. Khan says, I need this. And they said, where can we find the money? Tax. Let's do a bond issue. You know, make him pony up more than 50% as he has done in other cities. He takes advantage of us because we have weak leadership in this city. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Linda in Mandarin. And uh, quite a few people share that same frustration that Linda shared. And we're going to go to Gary now in Jacksonville. Gary, good morning and welcome to the conversation. Good morning. Um, I think that the answer is fairly simple. A, a lot of the incentives that, that we give, Con, uh, are in the form of tax revenues that are on land that we're not collecting tax revenue on anyway, and it's a way for the city to help to direct development. But, you know, whatever concessions that we make that we decide they're in the city's best interest, we should have a pay-for-performance plan that for every game that the Jaguars lose, the taxes go up. They repay us and just let them have some more skin in the game. All right. Thank you so much, Gary and Jacksonville. Claire, you want to finish us up on that topic? Sure. I think the callers have made great points. There's a caller a few minutes ago that was talking about the school tax and other mm-hmm. taxes. And there's, I think, things that people care more about or that are more pressing when it comes to where they want their taxpayer money to go, especially when we have a billionaire owner of the of the football team. I know that the Jags president, Mary Lamping, has said that um, most Teams, when they decide to move, it's about the stadium, not about wins or losses, but it probably will come down to, you know, having a winning team for people to want to have tax incentives go towards them and towards the stadium.
Absolutely, and especially when diehard fans are willing to sit through the harsh elements exactly. in order to enjoy a game. Absolutely. Well, we're going to switch topics. We're going to talk about pedestrian deaths, and I want to hear from you. 549-2937. That's 549-2937. Jacksonville Today, Jack Today did a amazing article talking about this, and if you have not subscribed to really a great way to start your morning, Check out Jacks today. You can learn more by heading to wjct.org and you can subscribe to the newsletter every morning. Jacksonville was named one of the most dangerous cities in America for pedestrians. I actually, I, I cycle, even though I'm a Husky guy, I, I cycle, I ride my bike. And uh, I can't tell you how many numerous times daily that I almost get hit. I almost got hit because someone wasn't paying attention to the walking sign, which was green. Um, and so it's very interesting that the Jacksonville metro area ranked sixth most deadly from 2016 to 2020 with six other Florida cities and the death rate, uh, was in the top 20. So Daytona beach was actually the most dangerous in the U S for people on foot. Um, Mark, I want to start with you because you actually walked through Jacksonville a couple of years ago. Um, your thoughts on us being named one of the most dangerous cities for pedestrians. Yeah, that's why I did that project was, you know, we have the largest city by land mass and one of the most, it was at that time, one of the most dangerous to walk in. So I'm, I'm going to walk all the way across it. Um, and so this is nothing new. Uh, we consistently rank in the top 10. We were, um, at one point we were third or fourth. Mm -hmm. uh, I think last year we were 10th, this year we're sixth. So it's, it, it fluctuates slightly, but we're we're again and again in the top ten. And the, I think the the name of the study is called you know it's dangerous by design. Mm -hmm. So the point being, this isn't an accident that that the the cities that rank this way rank this way consistently. And you you visit places that do not rank this way, and you look at the way they're laid out and what they have the infrastructure. It's it's not an accident that they have much fewer deaths. Um, you know we're making we're making progress. We have things you know that uh, g give us reasons to be talk about walking the Emerald Trail, the mm -hmm. the path that's going across the Fuller Warren. There's there the last mayoral uh, budget presentation included some pretty dramatic things. Um, so there is reason for hope, but we we have a long long way to go. And um, so there, that's that's kind of my thoughts on it. Five four nine two nine three seven. That's five four nine two nine three seven. And and to be fair, the city did add safer pedestrian crossings in twenty twenty. They allocated three hundred thousand dollars more for crosswalk improvements last year. Um, what's interesting is that more than fifty pedestrians died in accidents both years. And I think it is worth mentioning how people drive. I mean, let's be honest. Some, there's a lot of recklessness on the roads. I mean, it's, it's scary. And so, like, I, I shared my experience, and that was just, you know, this week. Um, Claire, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I did some reporting on pedestrian deaths last year, too, when there was also, you know, a high number of deaths. And, you know, I saw that in 2018, pedestrian deaths in Jacksonville had actually fallen. That was the year after the city had issued its pedestrian and bicycle master plan and had addressed some of the most dangerous crosswalks that they had marked in the city. So I think when there is the political will, as, as Mark was saying, there there are some opportunities to improve this. But some of the pedestrian advocates that I also talked to when I when I reported on this previously were saying that there's really not a lot of pedestrians representing people on city council, mm -hmm. not a lot of people walking that are voting for our city council. And so really the the interests of people that are riding buses and walking between buses and on, on these dangerous crosswalks aren't represented that heavily on in our political leadership in the city. And it's very interesting because especially with a lot of the construction around our building here, um, I from time to time will bike into work and it is when i tell you a nightmare it's a nightmare because it's not the sidewalk isn't even complete in certain sections so i have to literally get off my bike walk through or there is no sidewalk whatsoever and i have to walk through the construction and i'm i'm just a normal person trying to get to work but i see people constantly walking along different roads in town or where there's a lot of construction and it seems that there's not a whole lot of thought and consideration for those that have to walk. And I think you bring up a good point, Claire. I think there, 
the, there's a lot of folks who are in leadership who do not have to go through this. They don't have to walk to work. They don't have to walk to the bus station. So it's hard to empathize with the people that, that do. Shelton, what are your thoughts? Well, I'll tell you, uh, I walk all the time. Uh, I'm not in the studio today, but normally if I was at the studio, I would leave the studio and take Bay Street all the way down towards uh, Water Street by where the landing used to be and take that all the way down to Lee Street uh, and then cross over into Riverside and then take Riverside down towards Five Points where I live. And just taking that route, you've got a number of like little blind spots, little, you know, I've, I've been hit a number of times, you know, mm. of course, you, usually on purpose, but it's still uh, a thing to be aware of. If you look at the cities that are having these issues, particularly in Florida, some of the commonalities are you've got a rapidly expanding populations. You've got rapid development. Uh, it's a lot of service industry people, uh, as, as we know, in St. Augustine, which has had a number of uh, unfortunate incidents. Uh, the cities that aren't having a lot of these problems are cities with highly developed uh, mass transit. Mm -hmm. uh, in a city like this, as we've developed... Uh, you know, the development, whether it's developments themselves or the roads are not necessarily uh, harmonious with each other. So this creates a lot of blind spots, a lot of choke points, uh, places where you see uh, a lot of these accidents are places where in other cities, those people would be using some form of mass transit to get through like say, you know, beach and St. John's Bluff or whatever. Um, the bicycle community has really led the way a lot on this because for a long time it was hard getting uh, city officials to really talk about this because no one really knew how to explain the problem. But over the last five years or so, I'd say that every segment of the community and uh, every part of town has been affected by this. We've all, you know, we all have like notable cases of pedestrians or bicyclists in our community that were run down um, or knocked over, or killed uh, through no fault of their own. And I think now we're starting to get critical mass but each city has to address these questions in a very specific way, uh, particularly here in Florida. Join the conversation. Give us a call at 549-2937. You can also reach out to me on the Twitter at Jamie Radio News, J-A-M-I-E Radio News. Let's go to Joe in Atlantic Beach. Good morning, Joe, and welcome to the conversation. Oh, thank you. Uh, thanks for a great discussion. Really love WJCT. Great conversations. I want to mention that uh, I almost got run over on the Union and Laura Street uh, downtown. I, I go there to leaflet uh, for the vegan outreach uh, sometimes on the weekends. And people do not uh, yield to the pedestrians, as you were mentioning before. And I actually also attended the city council meeting uh, one, one time at the city hall to increase the timing for the uh, walk lights for the pedestrians and there was no not much support there for that so it was very frustrating thank you so much and a great show thank you so much joe you know that is a good point i you know there's also a lot of construction uh near baptist hospital and i was driving through there the other day and people would not stop for nurses and doctors trying to cross the street they would not yield to the pedestrians there stephanie in murray hill welcome to the conversation Thanks, Jamie. I just wanted to thank you for bringing this topic up. I live in Murray Hill and I chose to live in the urban core because there are so many great businesses and destinations, parks that are bikeable from my house. Uh, I ride an e-bike with my two daughters, my five-year-old and my two-year-old, and we have so much fun with it. We go all over the place. We can even bike downtown, uh, but we need much more safe, protected bike infrastructure. Bike lanes are really not sufficient. They don't actually protect you with a physical barrier. Mm -hmm. And so protected bike lanes have become more in vogue that actually create some sort of physical barrier between the cyclist and the road. And I think this is really good for our city overall, whether you cycle or not, because as we continue to grow, we don't want more traffic. Nobody wants more tr trouble looking for parking. And so the more people who are willing to make trips on foot and on, on a bike are actually helping the entire city. So um, Matt Fall at the city of Jacksonville is doing a great job. He's a bike ped coordinator. Um, and I'm really excited about the Emerald Trail as infrastructure. And I would really love to see us create more protected bike lanes, especially in our dense neighborhoods where uh, business and residential are mixed together. There's so many car trips that we take in Jacksonville that could easily be taken on a bike. Thanks right. so much. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Jack Webb, your thoughts? Yeah, uh, Jamie, you're preaching to the choir when you bring this topic up with me because I ride my bicycle every morning as well. 
and I live in Mandarin. And mm-hmm. Mandarin, as you know, I live right off, you know, not far from the speedway that we call San Jose Boulevard. Yeah. And uh, with all the traffic shooting across from St. John's County. And, you know, a couple of your, a couple of your, two, your uh, uh, points that you made are dead on. I mean, like new construction, for example. When, why does a private developer get the right to shut down an entire block of a, of a sidewalk? What, yeah. what happens to those people who are walking down a sidewalk, to the mothers who are out there with, with their strollers? What are they supposed to do, walk and send them to say Boulevard? I mean, come on. I mean, that said, that said uh, uh, on a personal level, personal note, I have a friend of mine who was actually struck by a car in San Jose Boulevard about, about probably two months ago. Thank mm. God he lived. He was okay. But you know what? The person was speeding who hit him. And he got a ticket because he was not crossing at the, at the proper spot. But the problem is crossing at the proper spot is even more dangerous than where he attempted to cross in, in any of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but that said, one of the, I, think, I think Mark nailed it as well. I mean, we're a big city. We're a big city. These, these issues are these, – I, I guess this is an issue that needs to be addressed neighborhood by neighborhood. In Mandarin, I would just say don't walk near, near San, San Jose Boulevard. People slow down. Be, be considerate. Uh, you know, um, it's – it's, it's dangerous out there. Like you say, every morning, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to say I take my life in my hands because it's, it's not, I don't want to be that dramatic, but uh, it, it, people do not pay attention. People mm-hmm. do not pay attention. They're shooting down San Jose. They're shooting down Blanding. They're shooting down Beach. They're on their way downtown. They're on their way to work. They're looking at cell phones. Yep. They're, they're combing their hair. They're doing whatever they are, and they're not paying attention to people who are in the crosswalk or not the crosswalk, and they're not paying attention to cyclists as well. All right, let's go to Joe in Fleming Island. Joe, welcome to the conversation. Hey, thanks. Great conversation here. Boy, I have so many stories, but what I wanted to really say is this, that without an increased police presence uh, that would really go after these aggressive drivers, uh, nothing's really going to change. I'm down in Fleming Island. I moved from Jackson. I, I watched a person get killed on a bicycle when I first moved to Jacksonville in 1986. What a nightmare. Mm. I had a beautiful 12-speed bike. I hung it up, and I never went back since. And that lady who called before from Murray Hill, great idea with the protected pathways. Yeah. My son and I, he's special needs. We bike all the time, but we, we never go into Jacksonville because it's so unprotected and it gives him the willies. So I think if they want more of a biking community, they're going to have to cough up some dollars and increase police presence. And I read one of the laws, I believe aggressive driving starts at a $250 ticket. And I think the police could easily issue those citations. And if the people don't want to pay it, well, then we impound their cars, I guess. I, I don't know what the solution is, but I've been to lots of cities where bike where was, that were a lot more bike friendly. Anyway, thanks for Thank letting you, me Thank you, Joe. Appreciate right it. On. All right. Thank take you. care. Mark, final thoughts. Um, well, I was thinking about what I watched the Tour de France the other day and the opening stage was in Copenhagen. And they talked about how when they they build a mile of road, they, they it's mandated they build a mile of bike pedestrian path. Mm-hmm. And that's just a different culture there. And we're probably never going to have that. But the the protected bike lanes is something that and bike ped is we, something we can do. Um, I went to New York a few months ago, first time in a few years. And, you know, it's always been a great walking city with Central Park and other places, but they, they've they carved out parts of their roads for protected p- spaces. Mm-hmm. And you you know how valuable every inch of pavement is there for, and they have so many vehicles and cars, but they've said this is important and it makes it, it changes the feel of streets and neighborhoods. Um, those are the kind of things we, we can do. Um, so I think they're... It, it, you know, he talked about enforcement, but I think it's more, yes, the design of how we design roads, how we design, make a place more walkable and bikeable. And the city of Jacksonville just recently posted on the, online uh, their plan for on-street bikeways and shared use path and trails and, and a network. And altogether, right now, the city's bikeways and trails consist of 887 miles of existing funded and planned bike lanes and bike buffers. And and so the this, this city's trying to be aware of it, but I think also there's a responsibility on all of us as drivers, right? To make sure that we're being mindful when we're driving, that we're paying attention, we're not on our phones, we're not doing all the things that you mentioned, Mark. It, it comes down to really making sure that we're thinking about others and putting others first as we're driving. Because 
I, I have seen it multiple times where someone will even, even in the crosswalk, will pull right into the crosswalk at a stoplight because they were looking at their phone and wasn't paying attention. So just be safe out there, folks. All right, we're going to talk schools now. Give us a call, 549-2937, school grades. Um, I had actually did a story earlier this week uh, outlining how Duval County's grades uh, came in, and I know that it was much relief for Dr. Green um, because there were several schools that were really teetering um, that have been turned around and a lot of others that uh, completely turned around, um, but still a lot more improvement needed. Um, Shelton, I want to start with you on the school grades, not just for Duval, but we saw them for you know, all the states in the, or all the schools in the uh, state, but uh, Duval, St. John's, um, w- we saw a lot of interesting data come out of that. Oh, absolutely. You know, uh, the grades that we give, the grades that are given to schools are kind of like the grades that are given to students themselves and that they're only, you know, kind of an indicator of progress. Um, so I wouldn't, you know, I'd be reluctant to, you know, read too much into it one way or another. But one thing we can say for sure is that uh, the teachers and students and parents here in Duval County and uh, around the state and around the country have done a a really good job, uh, an exceptional job of holding up under very difficult circumstances. Uh, I went to um, a a senior award ceremony out at Paxson a few weeks ago, and I was thinking about it for those kids that were those graduating seniors, they've known nothing but chaos the whole time that they were going through high school. Uh, They, you know, this is probably, well, this most recent school year was the third year of the pandemic, if you want to look at it. Um, A lot of people have really been forced to kind of uh, adjust and find new ways of doing things, uh, as we all have. Um, We deserve to uh, take a little, take a moment now to just kind of say thanks to the kids for putting up with us because the problems they're having, it's not their fault. Uh, adults on both sides of the aisle, whether it's the teachers unions, whether it's the the governor, whether it's the different uh, city officials up and down the state have used um, these kids and their livelihoods as political pawns for years. Mm -hmm. And the kids have had very little uh, oversight, very little veto power on like the various bad ideas and, you know, disastrous decisions that have been forced on them, you know, including like just the matter of public safety. Uh, If you know, I've, I always I always joke about it, but it's not really a joke. If you if you fired most elected officials in uh, the state of Florida and replaced them with the smartest high school senior in their district, things would immediately uh, be going much better. Um, and I think that's not even uh, that's not even debatable at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. We want to hear from our listeners as well. Give us a call, 549-2937. That's 549-2937. What are your thoughts on the state of local schools after these grades recently came out? Claire, your response to uh, this news coming out this week. Well, I think one of the most interesting data in the in the school grades this week was really seeing that, by and large, charters didn't weather COVID as well as traditional schools did in Duval County. We saw and Mark Woods had a great column about this in the Times Union this week that, you know, charters make up only about 20 percent of of schools, but we're almost half of the of the DNF schools. And three years ago, you know, all of the charter or all of the non-charter schools that got D's in 2019 managed to bring those up by by this year to B's or C's. But all of the charter schools that got D's in, in 2019, none of them brought them up, all, all of them you know, again, got D's or or one got an incomplete. And what Diana Green was saying to the school board this week during the school board meeting on Monday is that the consequences for charter schools that have D's two years in a row really aren't clear like they are for traditional schools. Traditional schools go into an official state turnaround program, whereas if a charter school is derated for multiple years, it it can just remain that way. And there's no formal process to, to turning that around. And Mark, I want to go to you next because, uh, you know, when we think of the thought behind charter schools, it's that you have a better experience than traditional schools or a more involved experience than traditional schools. Um, Particularly when you look at the black community, there's a lot of thinking that, well, if my kid can get to a charter school, maybe they'll have a better experience than they would have in the traditional classroom setting. Um, And we've seen a huge increase in the number of charter schools in uh, Duval County, especially 
Um, how does, you know, and, and, and Claire just mentioned a lot of this, how does all of that come into play when it comes to the sustainability, the success, and whether or not these charter schools are, are going to be able to continue on this path, especially when the kids in the end suffer because they're not getting what they need? Right. Yeah. When I wrote this, um, you know, first of all, when I wrote the column, I kind of wanted to echo what Shelton said, to kind of applaud everybody for making it through the last few years. And mm -hmm. no, no matter what school you're teaching in, if you're homeschooling, if you're, I mean, yeah, to the kids, the teachers, anybody who's still teaching, I give them credit. Um, but yeah, there's been this long kind of ongoing narrative to vilify public schools and that, you know, the, look at these grades. We need to um, three years ago, they were the state was literally talking about taking over some Duval County schools mm -hmm. and handing them to charter operators, that that was the solution. So this wasn't necessarily to vilify charters. I feel like there's a place for them. There are good charters. But that idea that this is the answer, I mean, if you look at the grades now that, again, to echo that stat, um, they make up about 20% of the schools, and that's growing substantially. It's continuing to grow but they were nearly half of the failing schools. Um, that's the kind of data that three years ago our, our, our state and local leaders would have been pounding their fists on the table about and saying something has to change. Mm -hmm. and, and now there's not much said about that. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very interesting, very interesting. Let's go to Dennis in Ponte Vedra. Dennis, good morning and welcome to the conversation. Hey, how are you guys today? I, I would just like to comment, I, I'm from California, my mom was a single mom, raised three kids on a teacher's salary, and um, I, I was just shocked to find the disparity in what teachers are paid, especially in Duval County. And, and I know many teachers that are struggling to live on the wage they get. So um, I would just like to point to that, that it could, that sort of signals the end of, of civilization when teachers can't afford to live. <laughs> but to tie in your last segment a little, if Sean Kahn wanted to uh, endear himself to the people of Jacksonville, he would maybe take on this issue and, and just do something symbolically to help with teacher salaries in, in mm. our in the county. All right. That's all I have. Thank you, Dennis. That, that's very interesting. And yeah, that there's more than one way to try to get a, a improvements or a new stadium, right? Very interesting indeed. Let's go to Stephen in Atlantic Beach on the phone. Good morning, Stephen. Welcome to the conversation. Hi. Um, I appreciate Dennis's comments too. Um, I, I go back to Mark's uh, column uh, this past week on schools and the, and the grades, how, how they have risen. Um, someone made a comment saying that if you fired all the elected officials, we'd have better government. Well, uh, don't fire our school board. They are excellent. They've done a great job getting us through this whole pandemic. The, the grades are rising and this push for charter schools, which has been coming out of the state government and the, uh, the past commissioner of education, Corcoran, uh, Nate Monroe had a good column on where the money, the school tax money has been going, and there's no accountability um, at the charter school level. And the people in the school board were saying the other night, well, we, we get complaints saying uh, that grades need to come up faster, but we, when we have the drag of the charter school grades, we have no say over those. Mm, Thank interesting. You. Thank you so much, Stephen, in Atlantic Beach. Claire, final thoughts. Right, exactly. When I was listening to the school board meeting on Monday night as well, that's that's what they were saying is that, you know, we, Duval schools maintained to be this year. They were happy about it, They especially weathering the pandemic. But that was brought down by DNF charter schools, and they made very clear during the school board meeting they were trying to communicate to the public that really this is out of our hands. We aren't the governing body over these charter schools that – that aren't up to par. All right. Well, I want to thank our media roundtable this morning, Jacksonville Today Enterprise reporter Claire Heddles. Thank you, Claire. Thanks, Jamie. Mark Woods of the Florida Times Union. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. And if you didn't get a chance to read Mark's article, go ahead and Google it because it is definitely worth the read. We want to thank attorney Jack Webb. Jack, thank you so much. 
And of course, as always, my my pledge buddy, pledge in mm -hmm. as far as NPR pledge buddy, Shelton Hall. As always, Shelton, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.